the quarterback battle is still going on. Is that good or bad for the Auburn Tigers? Well, Zach, I, I actually just finished crushing some chicken farm, and I am, I am freaking ready to rock and roll. You are Locked On Auburn, your daily podcast on the Auburn Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on into Locked On Auburn, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Blackerby. Thank you so much for making Locked On Auburn your first listen every single day. Day. Joining us as he does every Wednesday for a War Report Wednesday, it's Mike G of the <laughs> War Report. Let's go. Mike G, I was on the way to practice yesterday. My front right tire, it explodes. It blows up. And I think there's a joke in there about the, the wheels falling off before the season starts. I, I feel like there's a joke in there. Ah, or, or, or. Yes. Yes. Or the team is going to blow up this season. That's it. I like that. All right. I like yeah. that. I like that a lot more. All right. So I'm, I'm having to go off of notes uh, as far as practice observations, but I think a few that were interesting. So okay. something that we've seen consistently throughout fall camp is quarterbacks going through a handoff drill. Obviously, that's an important part of ball security and things that they need to make sure the connection between the quarterback and the running backs are sound. And we've always kind of just said, okay, whoever's next to tank is the starter. Whoever's next to Jarquez is the, is the two and so on. Damari three and Sean Jackson four. Well, they both, uh, both TJ Finley and Robbie Ashford switched off reps with tank Bigsby. And so I've said, you know, over the last few days that yesterday would be the day where Auburn announced the starting quarterback, um, I am now wrong officially as this goes up Wednesday morning, but it seems like Mike G this, this battle's still going. Uh, yeah. You and I talked about this, uh, offline, uh, yesterday about, we'll about uh, offline a lot. Yeah. About, uh, I know you felt like they would announce a starting quarterback today. Yeah. I'm on record as saying, I think that, um, because later it, this week, right? Yeah, later this week or next week. I mean, I just don't think it matters because it doesn't matter who starts versus Mercer. I think that the, you know whoever starts versus Mercer, it's gonna be you know kind of ceremonial. It's not gonna be. It's not gonna mean a whole bunch because we're still going to be evaluating that position into the second and third week going into Penn State. So but, no but don't you don't you think it matters in the sense of whoever does start against Mercer? is probably the most likely to start against Penn State and the most likely to start against Missouri and the most likely to start against LSU. Wouldn't you say it's more likely that whoever trots out there first continues to trot out there? I think that's what conventional wisdom would say, but that uh -huh. assume, that assumes that whoever goes out there first won the race by a wide enough margin that they might hold on to it. Now, a lot of people feel like, Unless there's a clear winner, we, you know, like if you have two quarterbacks, you have no quarterbacks. I, I don't think that's what's going on here. I think you have two quarterbacks right now in the race that provide very different dynamics for this offense. Sure. And one, you cannot evaluate because you couldn't go live with your quarterbacks. Nobody goes live with their quarterbacks. Nobody risks getting their quarterback hurt just to see if they can break a 90 yarder in practice. Yeah, so, right. you know, I think they want to see what Robbie Ashford can do for this offense. Um, I think they know what they have in TJ Finley. This is about Robbie Ashford, mm. right? Can he provide a different dynamic for this offense in case of emergency? Uh, we've heard some things about Nick Brahms, maybe not going to play the season. Like, you know, if the line isn't what we thought it was going to be, one of the most experienced returning lines and Nick Brahms anchoring that, you might need something different at, the, at, at quarterback, and I think they're exploring that. Yeah, and, and we'll go over the offensive line, the first and second team offensive line. It's a little bit different than what we talked about yesterday here on the show. So the, the big talking point, and you kind of hinted at it, I don't think you explicitly said it, but you've hinted at it in what you were just saying, is the quarterback battle is going to continue through Mercer and San Jose State going into Penn State, right? That, that's what a lot of people are saying. And that's probably true. I, I think I agree with that. But let's talk about just for a second what exactly that means and what exactly that looks like. Okay. So do you think that means that, you know, QB1A starts the game and does a few drives, and then QB1B goes in and plays the same amount of snaps? Like, what is that position battle going into Mercer and San Jose State 
look like from a diplomatic standpoint? Uh, okay, so here's what I think will happen. Uh, I'll answer your question and say what I think will happen. CJ yeah. Finley is going to go out there first. I sure. think that he's done enough this offseason. He's done enough in meetings and practices to earn the right to go out there first. Okay. Um, you know, and a lot of people, a lot of fans want to see is this improvement that we've heard about, is it going to translate to the field on Saturdays? He's going to get a chance to show whether it has or it hasn't against some pretty weak opponents, some opponents that they should beat. Totally. If it hasn't translated in a clear and obvious way, here comes Robbie Ashford. Right, it's pretty simple. So TJ goes out there first. Pause this for a second. Pause. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to make sure we're on the same page here, and I'm asking questions as you go along because mm -hmm. a lot of people are saying this, but I don't think we're actually talking about it. So, okay, I, I agree with you. So, but what is what is TJ Finley going out there and looking good and looking the part? What does that actually look like? Because I think we all can agree, Auburn can score 35 points against Mercer in the first half in theory and still not look good, right? Yeah. Or the quarterback play not be great. So. What are we talking about here? Are we talking about reads that, you know, the fan base may not really be able to see, but the coaching staff will be able to? Is it, obviously, accuracy is going to be a big part of it, but I think guys are going to be kind of wide open. So how much of that can you really decipher from this? Um, well, guys were wide open. Guys were wide open over the last three games of, of last season, and they're... they weren't hit. So, I mean, again, that's the obvious improvement I think that people are going to be looking for, Zach. So it's accurate passing. It's accurate passing and good decisions with the football. And third, quick decisions with the football. Mm -hmm. He's not mobile. So he's going to have to get the ball out of his hands. Teams are going to pin their ears back, and they're going to try to get to him to see if they can rattle him. I expect even, even if they're not able to do it, I expect Mercer and San Jose State to at least attempt it if he's in the game. If under those circumstances it looks iffy, again, that opens the door for, for a half a football, a half a football versus Mercer. That's what we're talking about here. You know, uh, you start the season, you give them a half to get in the flow of the game. You make sure you're calling plays. You give it a chance to look so good. You're saying TJ's in for the whole first half. That's yes, what you're correct. saying. Correct. Okay. That's Got what it. I think. I think. Okay. And then at the half, if it looks iffy, right? Because there's, there's no there's no scenario under which. Define right? iffy. Like. Two scores? Three scores? Like, we're not. We're not. Sco like, we're. Sco Winning in three? spite of him. We're winning in three type thing? Or yeah, well, is it not even scored? Does the score not even matter? Okay, let me put it this way. Like, um, maybe it's 21 to zero, but he's like four for 13 or something like that. Got it. And, you know, we're winning in spite of him or whoever starts out there. I think you go to the next guy at the half and you see if that guy can keep run the offense more fluidly and make the passes that need to be made and put up a better stat line. And you keep the starters in. But you, right. just, you just change quarterbacks. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't see a scenario under which Robbie Ashford doesn't play a significant amount of time in game one. You're either he's playing well and 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 and, and he, he gets out early, you put Robbie in, or he plays poorly and you pull him early, you put Robbie in. Either way, we're going to see Robbie Ashford. Okay, so I think a lot of people are saying this. And, and let me tell you, let me tell you why I don't think that fully makes sense in, in just a moment right here on Locked on Auburn. Look, we've talked about the importance of this before. It can happen so easily. You're out with your friends or your coworkers. You're putting back a few drinks. A few becomes a few too many. It's time to go. And for a moment, you think of calling for a ride. Nah, you're a good driver. You live nearby. You can make it home okay. And what are the odds you'll get pulled over? And even if so, what's the worst that could happen? You lose your license. You lose your job. You lose your car. You, you kill someone. It only takes them one mistake, one moment to change your life or someone else's forever. Play it safe and plan ahead to get a ride, drive sober, or get pulled over. Mike G, our guest on this War Report Wednesday. All right, so I think if they play it that way that you're talking about, and, and I agree, I think we will see it that way. I, I think we're going to see it that way. I think we see it that way for Mercer and San Jose State. But I believe if that's the way it plays out, TJ is their guy. And I think if it's a legitimate competition where this coaching staff doesn't know and they want to give Robbie Ashford the true benefit of the doubt, I think you have to play him earlier in the game. And I'm not saying you absolutely just pull TJ, but like if you're making this kind of saying, hey, we're really treating Mercer like it's a scrimmage. Obviously, it's a game, but like mm -hmm. we, we need our quarterbacks to go in just because we feel like we can play with our food because they're Mercer. And like, that's cool. You probably can. Um, 
I think you give TJ two or three drives, and then you give Robbie two or three drives. I, I think putting Robbie in in a game where you're winning, I don't care like how you got to 21-0, but you put Robbie in, like I don't think you learn that much. Mm, see, okay, I'm I'm iffy on this, Zach. I'm really iffy on this because I and think – Before I, we continue, I, I think both of these options are ridiculous. Like, can we agree on this? Like, this is so, like, ridiculous that we're having to have this conversation. But I do think it's interesting. I just want to discuss the big narrative that every Auburn fan is saying about how this quarterback battle is going to look going into these first two games. And I just think both of these options – are a little weird, and I don't know if it's really good for the team long term. But I just think we need to discuss it. Yeah, I, a lot of fans feel like it. You know, if we go out there, if TJ starts, we're stuck with him the whole season. I think that's what a lot of people are saying. They're like, "Oh, if TJ starts five wins," and I'm like, it, "You know, if we're on a five win track, he's going to get pulled." I don't understand why people are rationally worried about him playing a whole season where he's the reason that we're not winning games. Oh, that's he, not he may happen. get pulled if he loses the first game. If he loses to Penn State, he may get pulled. Right, what it looks like, you know. Yeah, so I just think you're you're evaluating the why. You know, if the offense is is sputtering, is it because of your quarterback? Is it because of your line? I mean, they've just got to look at the different options. That's why I'm I'm thinking two or three drives. It just depends. It depends on how those two or three drives go. How are people performing around him? Have you given enough time to properly evaluate the guy that you technically picked to be the starter? So they're going to have to feel that's part of why these guys make this much money. They're going to have to figure out how to, you know, to manage that during the game so that they yeah. get the information that they need so that by Penn State, you have either an entrenched starter or you're making a change. It's 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 simple. I, I, I don't think it's possible to get all the information you quote unquote need as far as, you know, the the. The theory that Robbie can be a gamer when you turn the lights on, and I think mm -hmm. he totally could be. I'm not saying he's not when I say this. But I don't think you could fully get the grasp of what a TJ-led offense looks like and a Robbie Ashford-led offense looks like in 2022 before Penn State unless you like start one against Mercer and start one against San Jose State, which that's not going to happen. That's yeah. not going to happen. That's, that's, that's the job that these yeah. coaches have to do, though. I think that that is... Um, I agree with you. I don't think you can get all that information, but the guy who makes $5 million is going to have to take all that information from practice and right. the game and say, this is the direction I'm deciding to go. And at some point you got to commit to an action. I think the only way you could learn everything you need to learn, and it still may be premature, but if somehow it's like when Auburn played Mercer a few years ago and it wasn't pretty and it's like you're losing or it's close and the first drive of the third quarter on offense actually matters, mm -hmm. and Robbie comes in, then to me, that's really the only scenario where I think we could actually learn everything we need to learn. You think uh, that's fair? Yeah, I agree. I just, okay. like I said, I, I think, um, guys, it's going to be a mix of things here, Zach. It's going to be a mix of, um, you know, what do we feel? Um, this is a tough deci decision. I mean, over almost half, six teams in the SEC – last year went to their number two quarterback for significant snaps at some point during the season. So this is, a, this is a common occurrence, man. Like, you know, uh, you know, our, our national title winner, the guy that they finished the season isn't the guy who won, won it in fall camp. Wow. So That's these coaches, these coaches have tough decisions to make. And then after that guy got healthy, they, it was like, do we go back to the guy that we picked or do we hang with this guy who honestly was pretty mediocre. He was doing enough for them to win games, but the team seemed to be in a groove. Uh, it's just a lot of things that these guys have to evaluate. I, do, I, think, I coach. do think, though, Mike G, I do think it's a little different when you're dealing with somebody being injured for sure. than, than a battle. How many of those six teams do you know were impacted because of injury? Do you know? Do you happen to know that? Yeah, it, I mean, it's a lot of them, right? Like, I mean, it's, it was, I would assume it's most, right? Yeah, yeah, right. It's most of them. It was injury, and then they just never went back to the other guy. So, you know, you have to have, this is this is a yeah. league where you have to have two guys that can do the job, period, right? So you may have to go to Robbie Ashford for other reasons or TJ Finley for other reasons or, hell, if it were last season, Zach Calzada by the end of the season. True. By the Iron Bowl. So you need right. more than one guy that can do the job. That's why I think I'm not – nobody should be freaking out about what happens against Mercer. They're developing. This is year one. You got one guy who's first year in Brian Harson's system and mm -hmm. another guy going into his second year. And 
you've let this flesh out all summer, and now you've got two guys at the top of the pecking order. Make sure they both get the requisite amount of snaps they need to be able to lead the offense in case of whatever scenario goes down this season. Is there a timing? Is there a day, whether it's Friday, Saturday? I mean, Saturday is the open scrimmage, so I think that's an interesting conversation in regards mm -hmm. to, like, um, is there a day where there's, like, a point of no return where it's, like, if you're Brian Harson, there's no point in announcing the starting quarterback? Yeah, now to me, I, to me, to me, it's more about giving love to the dude who earned it than it is about like making the announcement itself. You know what I mean? And so th that to me is why I'm a little surprised it hasn't happened yet. I'm actually very surprised it hasn't happened yet. I'm not going to okay. doubt it. I'm shocked that it hasn't happened yet because like there's just no way it's not TJ that starts against Mercer. Oh. Now, once again, does that matter? Does it matter? Probably not. Actually, I think it does matter a good bit, but a lot of people don't think seem to think it matters. And so I'm just I'm just surprised. I'm just surprised it hasn't happened yet. And so my question to you, is there a point of no return? Like if he doesn't announce it by the open practice on Saturday, you know, and you go into your game week preparation without naming it, is there a point to naming it at all? Uh now you and I talked about this last where I was just like, see, I don't I don't know that it matters at all like you there's a number of reasons why he could he might be playing this close to the vest ultimately it's mercer so you hope whoever you try to you don't have to play mind games with mercer you should be able to go out there and just beat them sure. uh, right. but, but ultimately uh i really believe that um the team the t as long as the team knows what's going on if they understand what the plan is it really doesn't matter what they tell us uh, because those guys will understand what the plan is and what they plan to do. So uh, we would like to know, certainly, um, but I don't think Brian Harson is particularly interested in sharing that plan with the media. He so care. he doesn't care. But I do. He does care about the fan base, and the fan base wants to know. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I think from that perspective, it is a little bit different of a conversation. But mm -hmm. can you imagine how fun it would be though if Robbie is the first guy out there against Mercer? Like oh, if he trots man. it out there, like the place would go crazy, Mike mm -hmm. G. If yeah. Robbie Ashford was there and the, or they announced it on the, you know, the, the opening lineups video that they do so well on the, on the jumbotron, if it was Robbie Ashford, like that would just be a crazy moment at yeah. stadium. That would be so fun. I, I listen, I think there's reason for excitement, Zach, no matter who goes out there, sure. but you know, people do not have to be worried about not seeing Robbie Ashford this season, mm -hmm. right? He's not, he's not going to be buried on the depth chart. Uh, I think they learned their lesson from that last season about having your backup ready to go because you might need him at some point and you can't throw him to the wolves when suddenly he gets thrust into duty because of injury or poor play or whatever it is. So um, I anticipate that we're moving toward an era where our coach prepares two guys to do the job the same way Bama has, the same way Georgia has, the same way other schools seemingly at the top of the SEC have had two guys that can do the job. I know it's not something that they're used to at Auburn, but maybe the, the feeling is TJ Finley has improved enough to be the starting quarterback. It is actually a tight race. Remember when we've been told in the past, oh, the guy who, you know, like he, he was being pushed by the backup and just, you know, we feel like we have two guys that can win the job. Maybe yeah, that's no. true this year. I, I think it is true this year. Yeah. I think it is true this year. Yeah, uh, 100% agree. All right. A lot of news happened yesterday in regards to team captains being named, as well as notes from the uh, most recent practice. We'll touch on all that right here on Locked on Auburn. I want to ask you real quick to uh, join our Discord. The Locked on Auburn Discord is free. All you have to do is click the link in the episode de uh, description down below, or if you listen on iTunes or Spotify, it's in the show notes. Um, just check that out. It's free. Just click the link. All right. So a few notes outside of the quarterback rotation. Okay. Uh, the first team offensive line from left to right was Zaire, Council, Tate Johnson, Keandre Jones, and Austin Troxel. So the big takeaways from this, uh, Tate Johnson is still a center, not Nick Brahms. Okay. And then Brandon Council is at left guard. I think the four out I think four out of the five are solidified. I think Brandon Council and Cam Stutz are still in a battle for left guard. Cam Stutz was dressed out, according to reports, but he did not line up while the media was viewing the 20 minutes yesterday. Second team offensive line from left to right, Brendan Coffey, Jeremiah Wright, Avery Jernigan, Jaleel Irvin, and Alec Jackson. Colby Smith has been lined up at that backup right tackle spot for the last few weeks, um, but Alec Jackson, I think... I said this yesterday, Mike G. I listed the two deep for every offensive lineman 
position. And then to the side, I put Alec Jackson and Jeremiah Wright because I feel like they're back. They're the true backups for like most of the positions, um, not just like right guard, not just right tackle. I, I think they're like solid to be able to play multiple positions. So hmm. I thought that was interesting. And then the third slot receiver behind Tavares Dawson and Javaris Johnson was Landon King and then Jay Fair. I think that's interesting. Yeah. Agreed. And, then, and then there was a lot of throwing, which I think is pointless if I can't like talk about where placement was and all that. So okay. I'm not some time on it. But to, to me, the offensive line thing is interesting. I, I think four out of the five, I don't think, do you think Nick Brahms plays? I don't think he's going to play this year. Yeah. Um, my heart goes out to this young man. Um, I it's had, good. I had picked him Zach in my top five, most important players of the season. Um, you know, again, you're talking yeah. about a, a captain on the on the offense in multiple ways. Uh, going one of the most senior guys in the SEC coming into the season. Uh, it's not just about his ability; it was about his mind. It was about his knowledge, his leadership. Uh, losing that hurts, and that actually changes my outlook for the offense quite a bit. Now I have a ton. Of, I have a lot more questions than I had a week ago. Now that we're almost certain that he's not going to play. So uh, ultimately what this comes down to is the O-line has to take step for steps forward this year, or mm -hmm. they're going to have to call a hell of a game plan um, to make sure that our, our tank isn't dodging defenders two yards deep in the backfield and that the quarterback, uh, particularly if it's TJ Finley has time to get the ball out of his hands in about 2.5 seconds on average. So like mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be tough, um, but uh, we'll see how this group develops. Hope maybe there's a surprise coming out of this. This is year two, and the Brian Harson get your weight up program, right? They changed that strength and conditioning program significantly. These guys are all reportedly, you know, forty to fifty percent stronger than they were last year. That's significant for oh, that's uh, college offensive linemen, and sure. you know, maybe they're a little bit more physically prepared to play the brand of football that Brian Harson tried to play last year. Uh, hopefully that's the case. Hopefully there's somebody who can step into Brahms' shoes, just like we're talking about developing the number two at quarterback. Honestly, a successful program, you need somebody at the two deep everywhere, center included. So, um, again, my condolences to Nick Brahms, man. Uh, you know, if he somehow decides to come back and play another season after this, takes a medical red shirt, whatever the case may be, I, I hope that he finds success in his future football life but but you you don't think he's playing this year i just want to confirm the, uh, yeah it's, don't it's think so. honestly based on what we've heard zach it it feels like it's a foregone conclusion that he's not going to play um do you struggle. think do you think there's an option mike g um once cam stutz is good to go if that's what he's dealing with i'm not fully sure why he wasn't dressed out but if cam stutz is at left guard would you rather have Brandon Council at center or Tate Johnson? That's a great question. A lot of, I haven't really thought about it. And this is a Brandon Council podcast. I don't say that as much as I used to, but a lot of YouTube comments yesterday were talking about like, what about Brandon Council at center? And I'm like, does your, does your, does your center need to be fast? Really uh, no, no, no. Okay. Cause, he just cause he, not be blown off the ball. That's kind okay. of because Brandon has universally been voted the slowest guy on the team. <laughs> like <laughs> most likely to get caught in a scary movie. Uh, his teammates have said he's pretty slow, um, but uh, but he's strong. And uh, again, if he can get the you know hike the ball and do the things that they need him to do, uh, I'm not against it. I, I I assume they were developing multiple contingencies at offensive line this, you got, this year. You, you got so yeah. so you know I was hoping that maybe we were in a position where you know, um, you could have guys step in at the natural too deep rather than reshuffling the whole O-line every time somebody goes down. But maybe maybe this is a well, chance well, for them to reset all that now. Well, right. And I kind of like the depth if Cam Stutz does start at left guard and Tate Johnson is at center. Because then you have Brandon Council, Alec Jackson, and Jeremiah Wright all as backup pieces. And I feel fine with all of those dudes. Even Alec Jackson at tackle. Like, I'm okay with that in a backup role. So... We'll see. We'll see what happens with all of that. Do you think regarding Brandon Council's speed, do you think um, if he wants to get faster, he should seek counsel for it? I'm so sorry. That was terrible. I felt bad saying that. I'm so sorry. Everybody um, needs counseling. Everybody needs counseling. No, no question. About it. All right. Hey, congratulations to the three 
2022 Auburn football captains, tight end John Samuel Schenker, mm-hmm. defensive end Derek Hall, and linebacker Owen Papo. Owen Papo is the uh, first captain to be a uh, captain two years in a row since Reese Dismukes. I think Reese was captain in 13 and 14. So cool. Mm-hmm. Congrats to Owen. That's a big deal. That's a big deal for sure. It is. It is. Uh, I'm happy for John Samuel. Samuel. He's one of my favorite players. Um, he's my talk- favorite player on this team. <laughs> yeah, he's he's just just a stand up guy. Just just what you want out of an athlete. Uh, he's a leader. Um, you know, he's a good teammate. You know, he works hard. Um, you know, he represented them well. Um, at SEC Media Days. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I like that. I like John Samuel Schenker a lot. Um, you know, he he you know paying for him, Zach. He had to watch the baseball team that he you know. Yeah, bailed on go to the college world series. He talked about that. He sacrificed a lot for Auburn football. So I hope that he finds much success this year as well, too. No question about it. Mike G, how can people find you, hear you, read you, all that stuff? Uh, we're doing some things over at the war report. So you can now go to the war report.com to find all our content. So the war report.com, go check us out there. Help us get lots of hits on their website. That is Mike G of the war report. Good guys over there for sure. All right. We'll be back tomorrow. If you made it this far into the video, please click that subscribe button, like the video, and read all of my written work at auburndaily.com. We'll see you tomorrow. This has been Locked on Auburn.